running a really awesome company. Yeah. yeah. Yes, this company together with Harold. And we were really impressed by all their hardware development. And today he will tell you something about the hardware development process for IoT devices. And it's up to you. So um, I'll talk to you about some hardware development a little bit, especially how to do it in very small groups like we are. We're a very small company, like four people, um, and we exist for about um, 11 years. So um, if we continue like this in 250,000 years, we will be the biggest, biggest Google, approximately. So, short time. So the, um, I'll, I'll show you a short fact about us, just one slide, very shortly. Um, so you know what we uh, do. Um, we are a little bit of a strange company because we, we do hardware development uh, like electronics, but we also build machines like cash handling machines, and um, we also do software development, and all of that uh, in a team of four, three to four people. So I want to show you today how we do the electronics development part and how you can do it yourself if you want to. Um, or at least get an overview on how to realize uh, electronics projects. So this won't be about software, mostly it will be about hardware and um, how to build um, printed circuit boards. So I'll give you a rough overview on the things I want to show you today. Um, first of all, um, how to build the PCBs themselves. And for that, I'll show you a couple of basics um, for those who are not familiar with uh, printed circuit boards, how, um, how the, the mechanics work, how you can produce, actually produce a printed circuit board for yourself, or have it produced, um, how you choose the components for your circuit board, for your IoT device, how you do the schematic design very briefly, how you design um, the parts on your on the board itself, how you do the prototype production, which is a very important uh, step, especially if you're very small and you have to do it on your own. You have to do some things very differently to big companies, and I show you the techniques and technologies we use, um, how you test your prototypes. And of course, um, future developments, at least what I, have, I hope um, those developments will be. And after the talk, we will build things like this. Um, it won't do anything, but um, it will be between the other and the other. So, I'll start with the basics of printed circuit boards. Um, this is yeah, the basic mechanical layer we need. Uh, to place more uh, components. So, what uh, does a circuit board consist of? Um, of course, the first thing you need uh, to know is what size should it be. Uh, we build in IoT devices, so a uh, smaller spectrum not bigger. We want it small. So, um, of course, PCB size. Um, one of the first very obvious things is the sodium mass, which is the green thing you see on PCB boards, uh, which is um, mainly not for the optics, but mainly um, to keep the soldier itself where it should be, and so the soldier doesn't blow over your board. And the soldier resist, the name says it already, um, is there to avoid soldier bridges between two points. Um, this is the thing you see when you see the color of the, of the board. Green is the most frequently used one, you can get it red, green, blue, whatever. That's the soldier mask. The number of copper layers, that's a very important part. Um, that's the number of structures you have layered beneath. So um, these are the numbers of, of, of uh, traces you can route on every layer, you can route your traces and you connect the traces with BLs. 
the stack of the, the build-up of these layers. We come to that in a minute. And of course, um, there are some um, considerations you have to make about the size of the traces, the size of the drills in the boards, and all that kind of stuff. We will come to that soon. Here is a six-layer board. You won't start with a six-layer board in the first time, but um, since we are in IoT, we want very high density boards. So you will have to have many couple layers. So you have a um, place to route your traces between all the chips and components and your connectors. Um, here is a basic um, six-layer board connected with vias. These are the vias which connect the different copper layers and traces. If you are building a PCB, you have to take care that you use as many layers as you need, but not as many as you want, because they are very expensive to manufacture. So if you're making a two-layer board, it's pretty cheap and easy. When you look up at the layers, you're going up at the cost, of course. Um, here are very special um, kinds of vias um, which are the interconnects between the layers um, the blind and buried via these are especially expensive so if you want the, if you want to keep the costs down you will try to avoid that and stay with it through all via so that's the basic build up you need to know if you are designing a PCB board um, what's not shown is the overlay so I mentioned here, the overlay is just um, um, a layer of information grain to what you see on your, uh, on your PCBs where you can um, write annotations. It's usually in white. Um, you can number your components so you can easily um, populate them later. So, um, if you still need to uh, get higher density out of the board, um, will have with um, devices that are getting smaller. Um, you can also use via your pad. This is a technology where, where you can connect um, pads where an actual, like actual part is sitting on um, through other layers in the pad. This is a quite um, complex process. You have to um, fill the pad with a, a solid conductive fill or non-conductive fill, depends on the technology and uh, you uh, coat it, uh, uh, you copper plate it. That's pretty expensive, but as you can imagine, you don't need an extra place for the VIA itself. You can just put it under a component pad and you save space. So, what are our, our component sizes we use? Um, these are boards you probably have seen from early days. It's, um, that's good through whole technology, as we call it. Um, you have to have to mount them manually with the by hand. So with soldier it by hand, you cut cut off the um, excess copper, soldier it, and that's um, hard to manufacture. It's expensive to manu manufacture. You usually can auto mount them, so you can use big place machines. So it may be more expensive to do it like this. And your IoT device will be big like this, so um, it's not really interesting to us. What's interesting to us is this technology type here, like medium density and the really small density. Of course, the smaller you get, the harder to, is it to mount the device. So you have to, have to make a trade-off between medium and small components. The thing is, um, as you move forward in, in technology, chips get smaller, so they have to have smaller pads, so we have smaller component sizes and it's harder to mount. Uh, on the other side, um, this uh, medium spacing is pretty easy to do by hand, so you have this problem where, where to go, do, do you go with medium sized parts or small sized parts? We'll come to that in a minute. Decide which component to use. But um, here's, here's an overview over all the component sizes relevant. The left side is mostly hand placeable, so if you say you 
can't do machine placement or don't have specialized uh, machines to place it, you'd rather have to stick with the less left side. The right side is for um, yeah, higher density ports, and you usually have to machine place them. There are options to manu place, manually place them, what we also do. I'll show you later how you do it. But you need quite specialist machines, and they are pretty expensive. You might get away placing VLS devices by hand, but um, it's, it's pretty hard. So, what are the basic building blocks if you want to buy an, uh, if you want to build an IoT PCB? The first thing you have to think about is how to power your equipment, of course. Um, probably it's uh, powered by a battery, uh, probably a LiPo rechargeable one. Uh, if it doesn't take a lot of power at all, you can use a button cell. Or if you need more power or connectivity, use, use your wall plug. You have to choose your um, power components, I think. Um, it's very important when you are considering building an IoT device to think very good about power management. Um, you, want, you want to have low power devices, of course, so you have to uh, choose your power parts very good. LEOs and bar converters are usually the parts you need first to convert power of your the voltage of your battery to the voltage you need for your microprocessor or whatever components you use in the board. So if you have, let's say, a 3.6 volts um, LiPo battery and you have a microcontroller running at 1.8 volts, you need to port a device that converts the voltage for you. You will want to use a buck converter uh, if you have the, the possibility to do so because buck converter is uh, much more efficient. The LPO more or less burns the excess energy, converts it to heat and that's it. A converter is much more effective in uh, converting power levels, uh, voltage levels to be precise, and um, can have efficiencies up to 95% or so. But they're also more expensive, they do need more external parts, as a well as a trade off. Of course, you need to have charging um, circuits or better fuel gauges, cell monitoring. Usually, you get an all integrated chip for that um, as well, so you don't have to manage it all yourself. Next thing is, of course, the microcontroller you use. Almost all, all IoT devices will really have microcontrollers and or plugging. Um, the plugging could be internal of the microcontroller, in this case, you wouldn't need it externally, uh, but in general, you need some kind of timing device. Um, FPGAs and DSPs are special parts. Um, we won't go much into it, but um, just that uh, you have heard the term. Um, FPGAs are pin programmable gateways. That's a part where you can um, program your logic into. So that's much more versatile than a microcontroller. You can, in fact, you can build your super microcontroller out of an FPGA um, with as much multiplication units as you need or whatever but it's pretty complex to use and um, but also very powerful. A DSP digital signal processor very interesting if you are yeah, very interesting if you are using um, voice encoding voice digital section whatever. What you always almost always want to have in an IoT device is some kind of radio module yeah, the only other version is you, you wire to it, you just like have an, an Ethernet port on it. Um, mostly you will use Wi Fi. Um, probably Bluetooth if you have a, a host that connects to the internet uh, or 6 local of course. Um, the thing is, radio modules are pretty complex to design. You need special technologies to measure them, you have to certify them, so it might be good to use it. A, a ready made module, you can put it on a circuit board like any other component, but it integrates an, its own processor, its own shielding, and its own, sometimes it's, its own antenna, 
and you don't have to worry about things that just work. You just communicate uh, to them over a serial protocol from your microcontroller. And of course, you have to have um, peripherals, digital analog uh, IOs, to communicate with whatever you want, really want to do with the device. Let's say you want to measure the room temperature, you could use an analog input and just uh, uh, some kind of analog temperature sensor. Connectors. Um, the difficult, difficult part is, on one hand, they are pretty expensive. Um, most, mostly they are more expensive than some, some uh, microcontrollers or other parts, but uh, you still have to have them if you want to plug anything into them. But um, if you can avoid connectors, do avoid them. So, how do you choose your components? Um, you can use parametric searches. You can just uh, go to any distributor and um, look for the category I've shown you before and tell the interface, the software interface on your website what kind of module do you need. For example, I need a Wi Fi module. Um, what kind of um, voltage rating should it have? kind of maximum power consumption with that. And you can filter down of all available components, the ones you need. Be careful which, with this kind of um, searches, since uh, it's not always um, the cheapest part you, uh, you find this way, even if you sort by price. It depends how your mass production looks like, but yeah, that's for another time. Um, check your power budget. Choose components as, as good as you can for their power consumption, also their idle power consumption. Read all the data sheets. All components come with data sheets. Read them very well. You might run in big troubles when you have the finished PCB and you overlook something. There are also errata sheets. They are very important for microcontrollers. These are silicon bugs, so these are bugs you cannot um, fix on your own. Probably even not with uh, software workarounds. Uh, for example, um, there are microcontrollers if they are new on the market where some ports simply don't, don't work in the first uh, version. Errata sheets will tell you these. So read errata sheets if they are available. But be careful when choosing components with non found features. If you have a microcontroller that has an integrated radio, you probably don't have real time capability on the rest of the microcontroller since it has to do the radio stuff in between. So if you need real time, consider that. And um, this is a very important part if you're a beginner. Check reference designs. You have finished reference designs, which you can, in a lot of cases, you can copy one to one. So you can use a part, use a microcontroller, use the reference design, and you have it all working. You don't have to think about how to wire it up, what kind of um, capacitors do you need, and, and whatever. The reference designs, they usually look pretty good. And if you're not sure, choose parts where have good reference designs for. And of course, you need good distributors. So, I have to keep going since my time is running out. Um, I'll rush over here a bit. Um, you need a good design software, of course, for your PCB. There are a couple, a couple of good ones. Um, I would have a look at KiteCat since it's open source and um, pretty advanced. You have to um, create your, uh, your parts in the software and then you can place it on the schematics editor and then the schematics are good for, for the first step. The second step would be to place them on the PCB board. So you first do the schematics and the second step, you do the PCB board layout. Simulation um, is a pretty good tool to test things um, before you build it. So you can um, put in your schematics here and get a simulation up there. Um, it's tricky, it's a bit different in the real world, but you um, can have its benefits. So, um, I'll brush through the basics here. Uh, And also through this, this is just um, how you uh, do a better layout. You can check the uh, slides later. I uh, will go on to the part 
how to assemble the board. This is the minimum you need um, to place the parts on the finished board. The board, you don't do it yourself, you order it with a PCB company. You just send them your design files, which come out of the designer, and that's it. Um, of course, you need to um, add soldier pads to the board. So that's the first step you do with your PCB board. Um, you need soldier pad paste to soldier it, and there are two ways. Sewage is cancel, and we're out of time. So I just finished this slide off and uh, you can use the rest of it later. You can use it with, uh, you can place it with tweezers, that's the cheapest way. We use um, these manual places um, which um, allow you to place smaller components and VGA placers are to place even smaller components with um, all brick arrays just um, for, um, for completeness. Automatic placement, I'll be done in a minute. Um, just show you this nice video. Um, this is how it works when this is automatically placed. This is pretty fast. This is even faster. Um, chip placing, if you no, don't do it by hand, this is how it's produced when you give it to a production company. These are the tools to test, of course. Won't go into that in detail. Production testing, also very important. Won't have time for this. This is my last slide for today. Um, it's all analog, nothing is digital in the electronics world. So um, this is, it, was a, it was a really uh, good uh, analog designer, but he was kind of wrong. You have to look at digital signals analog in the, digi in, in, in the PCB world and in the electronics world, um, especially for the software designers of you. That's uh, very important. Think we won't go into two details, but then um, that's that's for another talk. So thank you. I have a, a list of links, and let's go over that for you. You can get it um, from the slides. I'll put it on, on the website. Um, a list of links for um, editors, simulation software tools, and of course my contact details if you have any further questions. Thank you.
So um, the PCB design depends very much on board, but the first thing we released I designed in about two days, um, the complete PCB. So, um, but that was a pretty easy one. Um, if it goes more complex, you can think um, one of the most time consuming parts is getting the right parts. So you have to read a lot of data sheets to get the right parts that can take weeks. Um, then you have to do the schematics. That's pretty fast if you've read all the data sheets before and know how they are used. Okay, so we read all of them before and then we design it today. Sure, we, uh, well, yeah, you have to. In that, in, that, um, in that instance where I said that two days, um, there were only like um, two or three relevant parts on there, so it wasn't much reading. But um, if you look at a little bit more complex, complex projects, we can show you some PCBs later on. Um, you have to compare a lot of, if you um, looking very much at um, 1,000 um, almost identical um, LEOs or components. I'll show you one of the more complex ones. Um, this one, the development time for this one was uh, about eight, one and a half years, but I um, would say 9% software. Because we had we have uh, Linux uh, drivers for them, these are kernel mode drivers, um, we have automatic code generation uh, for the microcontroller. This is a little bit smaller, this is a um, four layer board, 0.5 mm thick and smaller components. These, um, I started to design this from the May uh, and did it part time. So um, that um, didn't take that much time. When you are done with the layout of the PCB, uh, you usually have to wait one to two weeks to get the PCB them themselves. Uh, mounting is, in that case, if you do it manually, a couple of hours, and all the rest is testing and software. I have a question. So I get this one and a half years is quite long time. When you have a customer who is interested in some of the projects, and you said, okay, in one and a half years we have first prototypes. Oh, yeah, the thing is, how we can, how we can yeah, the thing is, this is a complete platform. This one and a half years is uh, a lot of software development. If you do like um, the software behind this, uh, this comes with like 15 different modules um, which you can plug in, and um, it's like uh, a big software project. Uh, even if you're a decent company um, and it's a big project, you have to have the time to do the software development. Uh, I had the first prototype of the main board uh, in about two weeks. So um, that's usually not the biggest issue when you develop the development hardware. But hardware today comes with software. And if you have a software layer you can build on, uh, things you usually develop in your company can reuse, um, then the development times are much so shorter. And this was a complete um, software platform project. This is from the scratch. This is from the scratch. This is with automatic code generation for a microcontroller and uh, something similar to a field programmable gate array that automatically connects the microcontroller to the different modules. And that's all generated, um, generated with a web interface where it just clicks together the modules you want to click, um, generate. And it gives you uh, the source code, which is programmed automatically on the board. So it's really a whole ecosystem. And um, if you consider that one and a half years is pretty good. The question was about uh, and for the whole platform. Uh, I can expect that this is difficult, but when I come to real quick projects, okay, I, I was thinking, okay, one and a half year, long time. It's not three years. Right? What what with this? Okay, you have a platform, and you can use piece of the platform. I mean, some of that. I'm just thinking. Yeah, and that, that, that be fast. So, okay, I understand. Yeah, um, we also use because you know, I'm from the software world. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, for me, hardware is okay. This is the first time I'm seeing how it's. Sure. How it goes, you know. And the thinking is usually uh, when we talk about the projects, is moving to the hardware side, 
And what does it mean? How do I hear it? So, yeah, no discussion anymore. Well, I and I try to understand uh, how to set up the conversation with the hardware or the, the company like you, yes, to understand the process which you develop and how it can be faster. This is the question. Yeah. 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 I can tell you two stories. I'm coming from uh, the machinery uh, sector of machinery mm -hmm. And uh, we recognize that the customers have a supermarket mentality. They think they can come to you, buy the stuff of hardware, and go home and use it. Mm -hmm. But if you want to buy an individual machinery for your problem, you have to wait for a year or two or three years because you have to rush the whole development process, the optimizing process, the documentation process, the certification process, and it depends time, great really time. And the customer of mine also in the electronic de uh, design branch has told me that he has made the first prototype of the board in two weeks. It was no problem. And then he needed one year mm -hmm. to found the errors in the documentation, the errors in the firmware, and the errors in the hardware parts, because they are learned in documentation. Some are in the errata, yes, I agree. But he has, he has checked it, and the device doesn't work. And he has had no idea why. And that is the beginning yeah. of the big investigation. Well, I'm coming from software, so I understand very good in, in that respect. Um, but we have to differentiate. That's a really bad story, I gotta say. Since um, in hardware, we are pretty good at uh, finding bugs, since we have things like oscilloscopes where you can look on the lowest level of communication and uh, processing. Um, it's much harder in software when you develop um, like uh, common mode drivers in Linux. There, uh, a huge amount of uh, undocumented bugs, features, errors, whatever. Um, if someone already did, um, yeah, problem development, probably know what I'm talking about. Um, but you have to consider this a, a platform. So if a customer comes, comes in this case and needs a solution, I have a platform where I have to develop a module like this and do this in, in weeks, if, uh, including testing. We plug it, plug it in here, uh, we adapt uh, the code generation, and it's good to go. So, um, one and a half years is really the platform development. And um, we have started from scratch here, since there is anything similar to my knowledge, um, like this one. You plug that, you can also plug it on a Raspberry Pi, and you have the, the Raspberry Pi platform, platform beneath it. So, you have a Linux, um, you have um, Automatically, automatically generated um, uh, in, in a dev folder, you have the um, uh, TTY devices uh, which, which uh, communicate to the serial ports or whatever you need, GPS, uh, GSM. I think this is a good thing to ask. On one side, I understand that the development of this platform is difficult and one and a half years is even is not so much time. On the other side, the many projects from the from our side of the PC coming okay this hardware should be inside the project but not so much time and we are looking for some solution for that namely we should uh, more restore the platforms which is available yes and what we can do with the platforms and say that kind exactly so um, what we did here is create a platform for a niche that wasn't there yet but um, if you need um, if you need a specific product, of course, you use a platform if you can. You won't develop a Linux store from scratch. There is no need for it. There are plenty out there. They're all very good. They're specialized, specialized in different areas. Mm -hmm. And this board and this technology is the last mile to connect to the outer world. So um, you have the connection um, from the um, Ethernet side into the Linux platform. Mm -hmm. And this is the connection to everything else. <coughs> Like sensors, like uh, motors, yeah. like yeah, GPS, GSM, sending SMS messages, getting geolocation, 
what that kind of stuff. And that's the idea. You plug it in, you click a button, you have your, uh, your interfaces uh, ready. And you are in the supermarket, right? And, yeah. And you just uh, connect your standard software to the, the ports. Cost of developing this platform. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is what you're comparing. Yeah, uh, it, it's um, these things are hard to um, okay number, but um, it's in the yeah. You can for people one and half year. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's a cost <laughs> but it's not a <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that's the calculation. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Daniel. And we continue the, the Schatzen uh, uh, right? <laughs>